Look with me this morning at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. This last week with all the rain, there hasn't been a whole lot to do. The grass out in front of the church hadn't been mowed because it's a bog out there. How many of you, your grass is about this tall? Oh, I'm saying about this tall, really. I was just doing my leg like this. Had an itch. It's interesting because um, when it rains like this, do we look and say, okay, what are all the things I can be doing right now? Or do we look for things where we can sit in a chair and just kind of listen to the rain fall? And just kind of vegetate out. Anybody been a vegetable this week? Come on. How many of you feel like a moldy vegetable? I have to tell you, the mushrooms in my front yard are dying because there's too much rain. That's really weird. You know, it's interesting, though, in this last week that God would lay such a message on my heart and, and not so much lay it on my heart, but it was already there because we're just going through Hebrews and I'm not trying to do a verse by verse. In fact, today you'll find that I go from chapter three to chapter four um, and I'll be going over to Genesis and uh, I might even get to Psalms if, if we get that far into the message, but we're going to be all over the place today. But, you know, when it comes to rest... And understanding rest, a lot of times people say, well, one day I will enter the rest that the Lord has for me. And we think eternal life. But I have to tell you something. In Hebrews chapter 4, it would suggest to us that that rest begins here. And I realize that most of us, when we say, oh, they've entered into rest, we're usually talking about somebody who's died. They're in repose. They're asleep or they're dead. When I say rest, what do you think of? Now, I've already offered up death. I've already offered up vegetating out. But what do you think of when I say the word rest? What comes to mind when you think of rest? Well, to the musician, it would probably mean a, 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 an amount of time where you don't play your instrument. A rest in music. To a retiree. Rest might be freedom from your labor. Let me tell you something, that's not all that it's cracked out to be. Because when you stop and cease your labor, a lot of times you're looking for something to do, and it's hard to find things to keep you occupied. Students, and I'm talking about high school kids, students, because college kids usually get this figured out by the time they get to college. I'm talking about students... They, are, they think of rest and they think of it as minimal functionality. <laughs> Did I get it right? To the traveler, rest might be the hotel that he stays at. So rest has many different meanings and many different ideas to it. In fact, it's, it, it can be used as a noun or a verb, the word rest. For example, a peace of mind or spirit. That's a noun. To be free of anxiety or disturbance, that's a verb. To cease from action or motion, that's a verb. To remain confident, trust, it's a verb. Something used as a support is a noun. Repose, asleep, or dead is a noun. So it's a multifunctional word, and everybody has their own idea of it, but today I hope that as we look at what it means to enter into the rest that God provides, that we'll see that it's much more than any of us could could put into a de definition. In fact, it may even revolutionize some of the ways that you think about your Christianity and about what God is doing in your life. Look with me at uh, Hebrews chapter 4. I want to just read verses 11 through 13. It's a passage, uh, 12 is a passage that many people are very familiar with, but unless you understand the context of it, you don't get all of it. It's a powerful verse all by itself, but I want you to see the verse before it, and I want you to see the verse after it, because they're critical to what we'll be studying today, wrapped up in the truth of God's Word. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? And we stand today because of verse 12, out of reverence. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of the disobedient. 
For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joint and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Father, we come before you and I pray that, Lord, as you've shared this in my heart and, Father, as others may have studied this along the way, I pray, Lord, that you would illuminate this path that we may be able to see what it is to be in your rest, truly. Father, I pray that you would guide our hearts and our minds, protect us from the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. A couple of things that I want to I want to point out to you. First of all, if his rest only deals with eternity, then... Can we be disobedient in eternity? The answer to that is no. Therefore, it is not about the rest of eternity. You have to remember this is written to the Jew. They understood the rest of God and what God's rest meant, or at least he was trying to point them back to it. And I would suggest to you today that you may not understand the fullness of God's rest. There are so many people in our world today that are living in controversy and turmoil and problems and all these other things. Let me tell you something. That is not from God. You may be saying, oh, he's just putting on me so I can bear the burden. i got to tell you, if you even think that way, you need to be careful with that because you may be in sin because you're not living in the rest that he provides through your faith. Now, I realize some people would say, you're mean. No, I'm not. Because God created the Sabbath, that day of rest, all the way back. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. He created it all the way back in the beginning, and it wasn't created for 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 God it was created for man God intended for us to rest you know some of y'all will get hung up on oh it's on the on Saturday or Sunday the new Sabbath and all that stop it because Hebrews points out what they understood of it and any other understanding of it has problems in scripture as we look at this and we talk about this and we look at the idea of entering his rest it can't be when we get to heaven because if we can be disobedient we can't be disobedient in heaven we've made our choice it also goes on to 13 and there's no creature hidden from his sight but all things are open and laid bare to to the eye of him with whom we have to do in other words God sees everything we do that's a theme all through scripture so it's not about entering his rest and everything's going to be fine it's about entering his rest right now and understanding what that rest is and what it means today a lot of people say I want peace the peace that passes all understanding I want joy let me tell you something until you come to a place where you can rest in him there will be no peace there will be no joy and that joy and that peace that come along will be fleeting moments because you've created them they're not from God Because the peace of God is something that endures, and it says that we must endure. I know some of you are already pulling out scriptures in your mind. Oh, take up your cross and follow after me, and you're going to have to suffer, and you're going to have to do this. But here's the thing. How was Paul able to suffer? In the Philippian jail, he was sitting there singing praises and hymns to God. I know that he was hurting, but what was on his mind? What was on his mind? God. God. And the peace that God brought even in the jail cell. You may be going through things going, oh my goodness, it's just so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about living in the peace of God even in the midst of the storm? Have you ever thought about it? Because that's the peace that the writer of Hebrews is trying to convey to us. It's not just a peace that happens when we die. It's a peace that we can live in here on this earth. Let me unfold this. Let me unpack it. I see many of you are looking at me kind of like a a horse at a new gate. Have you ever felt the power of God's word, as it says, the two-edged sword that cuts everything and, and even through your motives? Have you felt that? Verse 12, we read that just a moment ago. The word of God is powerful. I agree with that, but I have to tell you, listen to the Word of God because He gives us a warning at the beginning of that. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, to desire it, to want it, to know it. But the only way we can desire it and know it is to desire Him. To know Him. This is why in Micah and in Isaiah, it talks about the fact of our relationship with Him. It's not about uh, us, us just knowing about Him. It's about us knowing Him. The intimate things that he knows about us we should desire to know about him what is his rest let's just start there so i can clear some of this up um i I don't want to be confusing today 
But I got to tell you something. If Christians would live and understand the idea of his rest, think about how much more powerful we would be as a force, not for ourselves or for this church, but for the kingdom of God. Some of you would say, are you going to go down another negative road? Let me tell you, the writer of Hebrews is taking them down a history lesson of the things that took place in chapter 3 and 4. He's talked to them about angels. He's talked to them about prophets. He's even talked to them in chapter one or chapter three, verse one. He's talked to them about falling away. He's talked about drifting. And so as we come back and we look at this and we get into chapter three and we consider the things that are there, let's first of all look at Hebrews chapter four, verse four. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4. We're backtracking from our original text. And the reason we're doing that is so that we can now fill in all of the spots, all of the holes. So I hope that you don't stop listening because you've already been upset. I don't want you upset. I want you to pay attention to what God's word has to say. And let it cut through those things in your life that are keeping you from that peace. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Let's go back to Genesis chapter one, verse, or chapter two, verse two. Genesis chapter two, verse two. I told you I was going to have you be going all over the place. The reference in Hebrews is all the way back to the beginning. So he's going on the, the, the knowledge that they had all the way back from creation, what the Hebrew accepted as the creation account, what we accept as the creation account. God is at this particular point, or the writer of Hebrews is going back and saying, let me remind you of a few things. And here's what he reminds them. Verse 2, Genesis chapter 2. But by the seventh day, God completed his work which had been uh, done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Let me ask you, while God was creating, was he going, oh man, that was a terrible day. Man, I'm so tired. All things are bad. No. Did God need to rest? Let's just answer that question real quick. So why did he create it? Well, let's get a a glimpse of that if we could. Uh, In Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is is Lord, even of the Sabbath. What Jesus is saying, and this is Jesus that's speaking. It wasn't made so that God could rest. The Sabbath was made for man so they could understand what it meant to rest. What happens when your body just goes seven days a week, 365 days a year? First of all, your body can't do that. Your body can't do that. It has to have a time of rest. It has to have it. And you know what? When you lay down and get a good sleep, do you feel good in the morning? All right, let's try that one more time. When you get a good night's sleep, do you feel good in the morning? Thank you. I even appreciated some of the other sounds because, yeah, we feel good. We got a good night's rest. And that's the picture that he's painting. It's rest for us. And when we enter in and understand that he created the Sabbath for us, it meant that he created not only rest from our labor, but rest from the things spiritually and physically that are put upon us in this world. Now, as a Christian, that ought to bring you great comfort. Instead of you looking at me cross-eyed and, uh, and weird and everything like that, you should be going, oh, okay, that makes sense. In Christ Jesus, we're to be able to rest. But not only in Christ Jesus, because he goes back and he picks it up into the Old Testament. He wanted his people to enter into his rest. In fact, he wanted them to enter in the promised land. And what did they do? Because of disbelief. They spent 40 years out in the wilderness. We're going to talk about all these things in just a minute. They didn't want to enter his rest. In fact, Joshua in Joshua 22 speaks of the fact that they go into their rest because they have, in essence, been faithful and believed that the Lord would accomplish what he said. So when we're talking about this, this isn't just about eternal rest. It's about daily rest. Wait a minute. Daily rest? Wouldn't it be great to just rest all day but get a lot done? How many of you work all day long and at the end of the day you feel like you haven't accomplished anything and it keeps you up at night? This is the other end of this. You've worked all day long and don't feel like you've hardly accomplished anything and when you lay down at night, what is in your brain? No rest. Do you get rest on those nights? I don't. When we consider this and we look at this, there are a couple of things that he says. 
In Hebrews chapter 4, going back to 4 again, and you, you have to go other places in Scripture because the writer of Hebrews is talking to the Hebrew, and I guarantee you that everything he says in Hebrews is mentioned somewhere else in the Bible. promise you that. The sufficiency of Christ is mentioned by Paul. We can see Jesus speaking to the things. We can see in their history these things speaking. So we have to take it in context to what it meant to them. He's not talking about going and being in heaven as many people believe that that's just our rest. It's not. It's about us coming to a place where we realize in Jesus Christ our rest begins when we trust and believe in Him. Wow. So... In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. This is speaking in the present. It's not speaking about going to heaven. God, when he created all the things on this earth, did all that he did, he rested. And it was a picture of what we would need, and only God could provide that time of rest. Only God could provide it back then. Is there any other time during the week of creation that he said, and let's rest tonight after we get done? No, he just said it was the beginning of this day and the end of this day, and it was good. But it comes specifically to that point, and it's God who gives the rest, and it shows us the picture of the rest he provides for us. The writer of Hebrews is pointing that out because he says, once we're in Christ Jesus, whose work is it? Whose work is it? It's His. And He's rested from His work. Our job is to be faithful in it and rest in Him. But we have to trust Him to do that. This is why He gives some examples going back to the main passage. In Hebrews chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. Let's look at that for just a minute. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them, failed to enter it because of disobedience. When we go a little bit further and we look at this and go backtracking in chapter 3, you're going to see what it was that they did wrong. In chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, Now Moses was faithful in all his house as servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. Now here's the example expressed. Watch this. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the the end, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He's talking about when they came out of Egypt and after he delivered them out of Egypt. And this is why it's so important that you know the history of this. He's talking about when they brought them out of Egypt, the promise was that they would go to a promised land and enter their rest. To go and be faithful and believing in God. But what was it that caused them to stray away? Disbelief? Disobedience? But after that generation died off, and we see this a little bit further in chapter 4. We won't have time to get to it today. But we see that Joshua takes them into the promised land. And he tells them at the end of Joshua, he says, go to your rest. But here's the thing, it wasn't just about that. It speaks about Moses, it speaks about Joshua, he even speaks about Jesus and David. All of them in their life could enter into that rest, but that rest came with obedience and belief. I would suggest to to all of us, including myself, that the rest that we seek can only be accomplished as according to God's word can only be accomplished when we choose to be obedient and believe. In fact, you will find that faith, coupled with, and I'm assigning salvation, faith alone, but out of that faith comes works. Why? Because we're obedient and we believe. 
Faith, faith and works don't bring salvation. Faith alone does, but out of faith. Did you catch that? Faith brings about obedience and belief. And obedience and belief produce works. But here's the thing. We can't understand the fullness of it until we understand what it means to be in His rest. You see, in their day, they didn't get to enter the rest. Those who chose not to because of disobedience and disbelief. They didn't want to believe. And they were disobedient to God. Now, let's fast forward that today and just let, let's try and, 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 and glean a little bit from this. When we're being obedient and we're having faith, tell me how you feel. When you know you're doing what God wants you to do, even in the midst of the struggle, isn't it easier to do it? And there's, a, there's a good feeling, even after a hard day, even after the difficulties of the day, there's a good feeling that you have. Why? Because you were obedient. That's the rest that God gives us. When we believe, even when we can't see and we can't explain what's going to happen next, I don't know, but I believe that He will see us through. Do you see? And this is the theme throughout all of the Scripture. Obedience, faith, belief. And what was it that kept them out of the promised land? Disobedience and unbelief. Can I suggest to you that in Hebrews, he's echoing the same things that we learned all the way back in the Old Testament, but it could also venture an idea before you, and that is that the same applies to you and to me. The nature of their sin, when the the spies went in, the nature of their sin was disbelief. That was their sin. They didn't believe God. They went in and they were even instructed, and this is what complicates it, this is what complicates because Moses created the either-or situation. Instead of allowing them to have a, a, a look at the promised land and say, it is everything that God said, he said, is it this or that? Check and see if this is that. Or check this way or that way. See if the walled cities are big and fortified. See how many people are there. And notice that he did it from... God didn't say that. He said, I promise you a land flowing with milk and honey. Go get it. Your rest is found there. But instead, in disbelief, they came back. And ten of them voted, along with the people, not to enter into his rest. (laughs) Can you see the correlation between us today? We choose not to enter into his rest because of disbelief and disobedience. He's already promised us. I've preached message after message on God's promises. He's promised these things. Do we believe them? Are we going to be obedient to those promises? Are we going to be obedient to him and believe his promises? Are we going to discount him and say, no, no, no. I'm going to see it my way and I'll work on my rest. Tell you what, how's that? Or let me ask you a question. How's that working for you? Don't work. Scripture tells us the closer we get to him, the closer he gets to us. This all makes sense. He goes a little bit further. Moses, when he gives that either or approach, his instructions divide the world into the either or category that ignores the nuances within the complex reality. There is a huge reality. Some some of you may be saying, what? We can rest now? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not. You can go back and kick back and say, okay, God's got this. It's that no matter what he calls me to do, I can rest in the fact that he's going to take care of me. He'll give me the sleep that I need. He'll give me the money that I need. He'll give me all the things that I need. But my rest is in him, not in what I can do. How many of you have ever come up with those get quick rich, uh, get rich quick schemes? You know what I'm talking about. I I don't know about you. My, My garage is filled with tools where I told my wife, if I had that, we could go into business and make lots of money. How's that working, baby? Where you at? Uh, yeah okay thank God she didn't remind me of it often but I'm reminded of that all the time in my own brain as I walk by those things and see I thought I would have peace financially if I had that but it didn't come before you judge me too far what is it in your life that your manufacturing is some kind of peace to say oh well this is what brings me peace stop it if you're producing it it isn't peace from God and that's why all the rest of it doesn't seem so peaceful 
It's resting in Him about everything. He ignored those things, and instead of asking such specific questions, what if he had said to them as they went into the promised land, think about this, if you were the ten spies and Moses said this, when you return, tell us what you see. He didn't do that. He said, tell me about the big cities, tell me about the inhabitants, tell me if they're big or little, if they, if they have armament, if they don't. Just tell me what you see. Because God said, when you get there, you'll see. But Moses sent him in and said, no, 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 look at these things. What would have happened if, uh, if he asked them or told them, how are the people? Perhaps um, just open-ended questions would probably be best, but what's the land like? What's the fruit like? What are those things like? But he didn't do that. He said, is it this or that? And so it sets up dualism. In fact, we still deal with dualism today. Good versus evil. And that's what Moses set up. And believe it or not, we still use that same pattern. In dualism in the Greek, in the Hellenistic dualism, it's good versus evil. And we still think that way. There are some people who believe that if I do enough good, it will offset my evil and I'm okay with God. Guess what? That's called dualism. And that's what they did back when they went into the, the promised land or were about to go into the promised land. They said, all right, let's stack up all the good things and all the bad things and see which one we want to do. And God's never worked that way. Ever. But we still operate that way in our world today. There are people all around us who believe that their good deeds offset their bad deeds and that's what gets them to heaven. They have no clue as to what it means about the rest of God they've never entered it you know if these scouts had been given that instruction maybe they came back and there would be a different story maybe there was would be more room to develop this less dualistic fashion maybe instead of it's all about good and evil I gotta tell you something when people equate God and Satan and they put them like they're equal to each other I, I just I have to be honest with you in my mind I'm slapping you I'd never do it intentionally on purpose physically but I got to tell you I'm slapping you because here's the thing here's Satan there's God there is no dualism God created all things Satan finds his being in God period why would I want to equate God and Satan God can be everywhere all at the same time Satan can only be one place at a time you go do the math I always love the book of Job because some people think that Job, that Satan that day that that they had that meeting before Job wound up in all the situation that he was thought you know even I thought it for years but something like you know Job Satan is just walking around and oh hey let me and just shows up at the meeting uh uh-uh. everybody that's at that meeting was there because God said you'll be at the meeting Satan didn't even want to be there You may be saying, why is God meeting with Satan? Because he's God. He's not fearful of Satan. it's, It's us who need to see him as the roaring lion. But it's God who gives us a peace and the rest about it because we know that he's over all of these things. Hello. So, the spies might have been inspired, bringing back a different description of what they saw. And the people might have said, then let's go take it. It's everything God said it would be. But they came back primed for dualism. They came back primed for either this or that. Isn't that the way we live our lives, though? And we do that with God. Well, I know what God wants me to do, but if I do that, then there's this. And do we not do that? God, I know what you want me to do this, but let me look at all the bad things that could happen if I do. And, and that doesn't stack up to all the good things. That So I think I'll just not do what you want me to do. And I can't answer for you, but I know that that goes on in all of our lives because it goes on in mine. And the Bible tells us it goes on in all of us. Well, we see that dualism. Well... I want you to know this story is quite important to us because in chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, he tells the story again. But he gives the same warning that we find in the second part of of verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did. But then in verse 9, he comes back 
And or we pick it up in verse uh, 14, excuse me. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our insu- assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoked me. And it just stops there, but it continues on in verse 16. For who provoked him when they heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? Those bodies fell in the wilderness. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. I don't know how you can put it any clearer. He goes back and he picks up that store and he says, they didn't get in because they didn't believe. They didn't have faith. They were disobedient by not doing what I told them to do. Why is it different today? Why do we see God in a different picture today? Why would we embrace Him in any other form than understanding this? You say, this is a God of judgment. No, He's not. Didn't Jesus say, if you love me, you'll keep my commands? If you're in my rest, won't you do what you're supposed to do and believe in me? How many times did He tell His disciples, oh, you of little faith. It's about believing, entering into his rest through faith, believing and being obedient. This is not a way or a ploy for preachers to get people to work in the church. Please understand that. Because obedience is not just something that you do when you're here. It's something you live out there. That obedience, when we know what's wrong, don't do it. And you may be saying, oh, but it's so hard. Let me tell you something. He said there's no temptation over in Corinthians. He said there's no temptation that's new to man. Nothing. And God will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you're able to bear. And with the temptation, give you a way of escape. In other words, you can bear these things in the world. And He will give you a way of escape if you say you can't. That's a promise from God. Wow. Do you get the picture of this rest thing? This is why I think Christianity oftentimes is hobbled because we don't get the fullness of this. He goes on to say in verse 18, and I want you to pay real close attention to this because he points out the two things. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. You see, when we believe, it draws out the obedience in us. Does it not? If you feel that a law is unfair or unjust, do you stand up and champion the cause? Or do you fight against it? You see, when you believe in the things of God, it causes you to say, no, 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 that's worth fighting for. Not fighting about, but fighting for. In my own mind, to keep Satan from putting those thoughts in there. Entering into his rest says that I know that you'll give me the answers. Most of the time we go home and we ask everybody else, what should we do with the situations and the problems of this world? Let me tell you, why don't you start with what God said. Trust me, enter into my rest. Believe that I can see you through it. How many times in your life have you given things over to God? And guess what? It worked out. How many times you held on to them and they just crumbled around you until you cried out to God and then they worked out? My thought is here, why not start there? Before you listen to everybody's advice, before you go to everybody else and say, what should I do? If they're not giving you biblical advice, all they're giving you is lip service. Because anything else that falls short of God's word cannot cut through the bone and the marrow. It doesn't reveal the truth of what's really going on in your life, but it says in that passage we read from the beginning, it's sharp as a two-edged sword, able to go through bone and marrow, able to figure out the true motives of our heart. You see, that's why we don't like going to God's Word first. We'd rather go to somebody else because the pop psychology that we have and all the things that people would tell us, tell you what, if they're not sending you to God's Word or at least walking you through God's Word or taking you to a place where you can study God's Word, run from them because they're not going to give you good advice. But there are many people out there who like to hear themselves talk. Did somebody say Pastor Jack? 
Stop it. It's interesting because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, we see again the same picture. And notice that he's giving some warnings here. In fact, if I could, you'll find three warnings in this. You'll, you'll find that it says, be diligent, hold fast, and take care. In this one we see, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. I can't help but think of the passage over in Romans. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the thing. How can you believe in something and be disobedient to it? And this was the argument that Christ gave. So before you start getting on to me, how can you say I love this but be disobedient to it? I understand the sinful nature. But that's what ought to break our heart because this is important and critical because when we get to chapter 6 and it talks about falling away to be renewed again and people say that's about losing your salvation, I would say it never was there. He's going and he's giving us a systematic look at this and the people that didn't enter into his rest is because they were disobedient and they didn't believe. And so when we look over later and we start dealing with the issues, this is why it's all foundational. We talked about fearing God. We talked about the supremacy of Christ. We talked about drifting away and how easy it was. And now we come to this and we see that as Christians we should enter into His rest. And when does that take place? That's when we believe and are obedient to all that He tells us to do. And that's nothing new. In fact, Peter says of baptism, he says, Baptism now saves you over in 1 Peter chapter 3. Not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Let me tell you something. When you're being obedient to God, and I tell you this all the time when I'm baptizing people, and pay attention carefully to this. I'm not scolding you. I'm saying this is so true. Baptism is the first step of obedience to Christ. It's not something the church pushes on someone. Has anybody here been told by this pastor that you have to be baptized? you're going to die and go to hell you have to be baptized or you're a terrible Christian no because the Bible is very clear on it it's not about my conscience toward God it's about your conscience toward God doing what he said and that's what Jesus keeps challenging the people to do what is it? do the will of the Father do and be obedient to the things he said and when we're obedient to the things that he said a cool thing happens we have a good conscience how many of you are living with a, 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 a dirty conscience? Just know you haven't been doing what God wants you to do. Here's a way to turn that around. Find your rest in Him. Stop struggling and thinking you're going to get away with it or stop thinking that, that things are just going to work out or that you can dig yourself out of a hole. The first thing an alcoholic will tell you is they can control their alcoholism. No, they can't. No, they can't. And just like the alcoholic or the chain smoker or anybody who's in an addictive behavior, which could be food, which I fall into that. Anybody with an addictive behavior understands something that you can't fix it just by saying, I'm going to do it. And you can go to the world. I love that little children's um, rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, set on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. It's interesting. All the king's horses and all the king's men. What he's saying here in Hebrews is, why are you going to all the horses and the men? Why aren't you coming to him? Because that's the only place you're going to find rest. That's the only place they've ever found rest. That's the only place you will ever find rest. And then one day when we go to be with him, we'll understand the fullness of that rest because we'll be with him. That's why I say, why, why wait till you get there? Why go through all of the struggles of life and everything and try and accomplish it on your own and do your own thing? Why would you want to do that? Well, he says in this about coming short in verse 2 of chapter 4, for indeed we have good news preached to us. Let's all just say what the good news is. Jesus. Let's try it again. Let's all just say it together. What's the good news? Thank you. Oh, they were loud over here. You guys, are y'all okay over here? Need calisthenics or anything? All right, let's try one more time. All right, you ready? What's the good news? Jesus. 
Thank you. I have to tell you, that's the good news. And that's what's preached to us. And this is why he's telling it to them, because he's trying to transition them from understanding that rest that they understood, which we can't have the full understanding of, except to go back and look at the story. He's trying to say, now listen, that rest is through Jesus Christ, because what did Jesus do? It says it in chapter 2. What did Jesus do after he uh, died and was buried and rose again? He sat down at the right hand of God. His work was done. But he's still working. But it's his joy to do it because he's our high priest today. That was completed and his rest, there's no more persecution that he's going to have to go through. In fact, the next time that he comes, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Wow! Do you get this? This is why we got to go back and we got to look at some of these things. It's interesting because what happens is when we want to enter into the rest of God, we start getting lazy. And that's what the children of Israel did. Even when they got in the promised land, the place where he says, I'm going to give you rest there. When they got in the promised land, what did they do? They began to disobey. Looking for other idols, unbelief. The two very things that kept them out of the promised land in the first place and all the people died off. And then you see a series of these things taking place in Judges because you see this judge rise up. Why? Because the people had sinned. They were disobedient and they didn't believe God. This is why you can't just say, well, this is, this is just something in, in, to the Hebrew. It is to all of them for all times. They understood this and that's why we need to understand it as well. Because it was unbelief. It was disobedience. Those were the things. And again, you may argue, so you're telling me I have to do what you say? Absolutely not, but you better be doing what God says to do. And if you are, you ought to have a clear conscience about it, and you ought to feel good about it and be resting in His peace. Because if you're not, are you really doing what God wants you to do, or are you just doing it for your own purposes? Got to be careful. I have to tell you, the Word speaks very, very loudly to us today about a good conscience. When Paul, when Peter is writing about baptism, he says that it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. When Jesus died on the cross, or when Jesus was baptized, it's very clear. He didn't go down because he needed to be saved. He didn't go down because he had sin to wash away. Jesus was the Savior and he was perfect. Why was he, uh, he baptized? Let's take a look at the end of chapter 3 of Matthew. If you want to see it, it's right there. He was baptized... And his father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. What do your parents say to you when you do what you were supposed to do? Maybe cleaning your room or or something like that when you were a child. Good job. How did it make you feel? Let me tell you, there's rest in that. It's good going back in your room saying, mom and dad are happy with me and I'm tickled. I'll do whatever they ask me to do next time. Not really. But I, I, I've learned something here. If I want to hear the good word of God and have the peace that he, he and only he can bring, I have to do it by first of all being obedient. Not to me, not to a church, but to him. And if I'm not being obedient to him, and I'm not believing that he can accomplish everything, people tell me they've got addictions. Let me tell you something. God knows how to deal with your addiction. You may say, oh, well, he's put all these people in the world and everything like that. But have you started with him first? Some people are so deep into their convi- into their addictions that they couldn't even look to God because not because they they want they don't want to it's 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 they'd like to they'd like to be healed but I think it's like the 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 lame man laying at the pool of Bethesda when Jesus comes in and says do you want to be healed and he says you know I've been laying here a long time and every time the, the angel swings stir the water I can't get into the water quick enough that isn't what Jesus asked do you want to be healed that's what he asked him. And I think Jesus could have healed him immediately if the man had said, yes, I do, and I know you can. But he doesn't. So often that's like us. Jesus gives us a clear, a clear promise. Lord, pull out your credentials. Let me make sure it's you. And if I don't like you, I'm going to check out that psychologist or that, that, that other person who can give me this or give me that and take care of everything that I've got as a problem. The scripture speaks of having a good conscience or God's rest. I would suggest to you it's about a good conscience, which is all through scripture as I've already pointed out in other places. The Greek word labor means to endeavor, give all diligence, be zealous, strive eagerly, exert oneself, and make haste. There's no place for sleepiness or laziness, complacency, or, or lethargy. 
in the work of God. Now, here's the thing. You know, you're saying, oh, great, you want to work us to death? No, 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 no. Whose rest are you in? You still thinking about your rest? Okay, you think about your rest all you want to, because I can tell you, if you're doing that, then you will say all of this is bigger than we could ever accomplish. Really? You would hobble God? No, you can't hobble God. But you would say God's not big enough to take care of whatever's going on in your life? Seriously? Some think about it, isn't it? God, you're not big enough. And we're going to come to that in chapter 6 again. Because they kept laying the foundation for salvation. And he said, stop it. Move on. Grow up. But here he comes to this and he says, that it's, this isn't a place for that. Because everything God calls us to do is healthy for us. It is coming out more and more that the people who just keep working... And I'm not talking about in a job. I'm talking about people who keep working. In fact, every time I have a senior come to me and say, you know, this is going on in my life and this is going on in my life and they're depressed and they're alone and everything, I'll tell them, get busy. Let me send you to a place where you can do stuff. You find where God would have you to go and join in there. I understand this idea because when you become, when you go to your own rest, guess what? It leads to death. Dead serious. You may be saying, I'm resting now, I've I've earned my retirement. Let me tell you, you haven't retired from the things of God. God's still working. And when you retire, all that means is you ought to be more involved in the things of God. Because he understands you have to pay bills. He put that curse on us all the way back in Genesis where he says, and from the sweat of your brow, you'll make a living. I get that. So the Bible tells you it's going to work. So for all you people out there going, I hate work and I can't wait to be free. Let me tell you something. The freedom you're seeking isn't going to satisfy because you'll need something to fill the void. Can I get an amen from anybody? That's the peace that man offers. Most countries in our world don't have retirement. And you know, when people retire, oftentimes they don't get involved in the things of God. But I got to tell you something. Work. Work. Till the day he calls you home. And if you work, remember a week or so back, I told you, you know, I'm always fearful of what I'm going to be doing when he comes. <laughs> if you're working and doing what, you, what he wants you to, why you got any fear? I keep telling myself that. So I just pass it on to you as a struggle with me. In Proverbs 19.15, it says, laziness cast into a deep, deep sleep. I'm thinking about the recliner at my house. And an idle man will suffer hunger. You know... I love my wife, but if she wasn't up making a meal, I'd probably sleep all day long. And if I slept all day long, I'd be hungry at the end of the day. And then I'd have to go make me something to eat. I thank the Lord for my wife that she feeds me every once in a while. And feeds me well, as you can see. Proverbs 20, verse 4. The sluggard does not plow after the autumn. So he begs during the harvest and has nothing. We find that in Haggai, the same kind of stuff. You work and you don't have anything. You, you plant seeds, but you don't have enough. Your, your purse has holes in it. There's never enough. You see, that's because they were trying to do it all to satisfy their stuff. Let me tell you something. If you're tired of the ash in your mouth and tired of it not working out, maybe you ought to enter into his rest and say, Lord, I'm going to just believe and, and be obedient. I, I know that sounds simplistic, but that's what the writer of Hebrews is telling the Hebrews. And the thing about it is he's got enough evidence to show them why they need to do it. Unless a person labors, in fact, if you want to, here's, my, here's one of my favorite Proverbs, Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provisions in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. Uh, the hands to rest, your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Unless a person labors with all diligence, he will fall into Israel, what Israel fell into. The same thing. What did they fall into? Disobedience and unbelief. You may be saying, so does that mean I'm not saved anymore? We'll deal with that on another day. But let's understand that you can't stay close to God when you're being disobedient and not believing. When we remember Israel's experience, the people would labor for a while and then fall back for a while. Labor again and then fall back. That's the time of the judges. Israel lived an up and down life and the nation was not allowed to enter God's rest. There's no place for inconsistency. It's a matter of choosing what I'm going to do. Have you ever made a decision about where you're going to go eat? 
I always love that conversation on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon when we're headed to whatever restaurant my wife is supposed to know and tell me about. You know that conversation, where you want to eat? I don't know where you want to eat. I don't know where you want I got to tell you, doesn't it frustrate you to have that little conversation? I've learned to just say McDonald's. She hates McDonald's. So I give her all the places she hates to eat. And so finally she comes up with a good place. But the reality of it, wouldn't it be better to just know where I'm going and what I'm doing and say, here's my confidence. I bet you she'd be, just her jaw would drop and hit the floor if I walked out to this and say, honey, here's where we're going to eat. Ain't happening, baby, I'm just saying. There's no place for inconsistency, no place for living the up and down life. You may be, I say there's no place for it, but the reality of it is, don't we do that all the time? Fall into the same thing Israel did. You ever feel like your life is doing this? Go back and what do you believe? Are you being obedient to that? Are you just saying, giving lip service to it? I believe. The Bible says that the demons believe. They know. But it doesn't mean that they're saved. They know about him. They know who he is. In fact, Jesus had to silence a lot of them when he was casting out demons. It says in scripture, and he wouldn't let them speak. That ought to tell you how much power God has. Wouldn't even let the demons speak. So, it's an everyday process. It's laboring every day. And it's laboring every day and it's an essential to our life. If we want to grow in Christ, it's not just something on Sunday. It's something we desire every day of the week to believe and be obedient to what He's called us to do. And believe what He said He would do. Isn't that the whole merit of faith? Isn't that what faith is all about? We can come short of God's rest because the gospel of rest has been preached. Even though I preach to you about Christ and the rest and the peace and the joy that he brings, I guarantee you when you're in his, in his rest, you'll understand the peace and the joy. All of those other things that we find, we'll find those things there. So, God's rest was preached to Israel as well. It's been preached to us in Jesus Christ. It's been preached to Israel in the Old Testament. It was loud and clear. There was no excuse for Israel. I would suggest there's no excuse for us. He's made it as clear as it needs to be. There are three things that I'll only have time to share. Well, let me just read them for you. There's a deep-seated rest that we can possess within our hearts. A satisfaction within our life. And it comes through God. Through His Son, Jesus Christ. There's a rest of deliverance and salvation through the wilderness of this life. Through all the trials and temptations and the storms of life. Did you catch that? There's a rest there too. There's a rest when we come to the new day a perfection of eternal life I've had several people come to me and say pastor you know I'm I, I know I'm going to heaven and I'm happy for that but how you doing on the faith and and the disbelief how you doing on obedience and when I come to that I come to that because of this the warning is clear in Hebrews to the Hebrew And to us today, we must believe the Word of God. The good news of God's rest. Do you believe that that's out there? I don't think it's just heaven. I think it's here on earth as well. I am not Jehovah's Witness. I am not any other religion that believes that the the kingdom is right now and happening right now. And that's part of what they believe. That's not what I'm saying. I believe Christ hasn't come back yet, but there's still peace that was available in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there's peace available today for us in Christ Jesus. If you don't know Christ, I have to tell you, these are some warnings for you. They're clear warnings we must believe. We must believe the Word of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, or we'll miss that rest. Not only temporal here, but we'll also miss it eternally there. 
we must never forget we are much more responsible because of Jesus Christ, God's own Son. One far greater than Moses, one far greater than Joshua, one far greater than David. He's the one that brings us rest. That's what he's trying to say to the Hebrews. But what a great message for us today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've not entered into that rest of salvation, let me tell you, it's not about all your deeds. It's about you surrendering to God's plan for your life, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to convey to the children of Israel, that God had a plan. In the New Testament, God's plan is Jesus Christ. He's offering that to you today. He's warning you, don't, don't let this slide. Don't leave this undone. Make sure if you're going to enter into his rest, make sure that you're entering into it because you understand what it means to have faith and to be obedient to him. Would you stand with me?